So, when I was growing up, it was desktop machines that were the resource constrained ones on the market. CPUs and GPUs were generally quite slow, memory was quite constrained, and we're now at this point in history where it's actually the devices in our users' pockets that are a lot more resource constrained. And that introduces a whole set of completely different problems to the way that we build for the web. Um, lately, we've been digging into what makes the web slow, how are people like, constructing their pages and sending them down to their users. And I want to talk a little bit about this idea of sciencing the web and the things that we can learn about digging into this space and understanding how pages are constructed. Um, it's interesting to think about like what actually slows the web down these days. On mobile, it can be a number of things. It can be cache eviction, parsing JavaScript, sending down just way too many images. And I thought it'd be interesting for us to dig into this a little bit. So as we start drifting into 2018, um, the biggest change that I think we could all be making is actually loading only what we need uh, when we need it. Uh, when it comes to our users' experiences. The way that the web has been historically constructed for mobile is unsustainable, in my opinion. Um, we've generally been loading everything for our users before showing anything, and that can lead to all sorts of different problems, like loading up megabytes and megabytes of code when the user might only need a very small slice of that. Now, loading only what you need when you need it is only one of a number of different best practices that we can think about when it comes to trying to construct pages that can load efficiently on mobile devices. You can do things like splitting up your JavaScript, preloading your resources. We'll cover some of these topics uh, in today's talk. But um, I first wanted to talk about what is the actual problem we're trying to solve here today. And I'd like to do that by introducing you to Gary. So Gary is trying to load up a page on slow 3G on an average mobile device. He's been waiting for a few seconds, and at this point, he still hasn't got any meaningful text on the screen. Web fonts are still loading up. Uh, JavaScript is blocking him from actually interacting on this page, and he's starting to question his life choices. He's wondering, you know, would it have been better for me to try loading up this experience on a more powerful device like a Tamagotchi, or a Fisher Price My First Laptop, or maybe even an Abacus? Poor Gary. But Gary introduces us to this idea of user expectations. What are the expectations that people have when they're trying to load on the web? Well, back in 2015, we introduced a model for user-centric performance, and we called it Rail. And one of the ideas behind Rail was that if you were loading a page, you were going to try getting it down to your users in about 1,000 milliseconds. Now, 1,000 milliseconds might be perfectly OK for desktop. But if you're on mobile and you're trying to send down something over 3G, it's really, really hard to get down a web page in 1,000 milliseconds. And so over the last couple of years, we've been rethinking loading performance in terms of a set of key user moments. Is it happening? Is it useful? And is it usable? These user moments end up culminating in sort of time to interactive, a moment where we think that pages on mobile can be really ready. So like if a user starts tapping or scrolling, they can actually do something. <coughs> now, a good goal for time to interactive for the experiences that we're building today is trying to make sure the user can actually interact with UI elements in about five seconds. If you're using a service worker, it's generally good to try getting it interactive in about two seconds on your repeat visits. In this case, this phone is actually kind of dead. There's nothing on screen. I think this person's going through some like withdrawal symptoms. It's, it seems. So what's really difficult about us actually accomplishing some of these goals? Um, phones have to establish a hard communication with a radio channel before they can get or send any data. And the network latencies that we often have to deal with on mobile can be significantly higher than a wired connection. And they can consume a significant portion of the budgets that we've got to actually deliver experiences to our users. If you're dealing in 3G or 4G, round trip costs can eat up your budget way, way quicker than you might think. You can end up spending hundreds and hundreds of milliseconds per RTT. If we're trying to render a web page quickly um, on 3G, this is what the typical sequence of communication between a browser and a server might look like. You can end up spending 600 milliseconds of this time just by the network overhead. The place where we have the ability to actually influence this is sort of the server response and in our client-side rendering. So today we're going to spend a lot of time on the client-side rendering part and trying to figure out how to optimize that. So how can we data science the web? Um, there are a number of tools that we can use for this process. Uh, it often ends up being you know, writing things like complex scripts that instrument web pages. 
Um, when I first got involved in data science, I thought that it looked a little bit like this. Like you were, you were literally just writing tons and tons of bash scripts and, and using Puppeteer and things like that. This guy isn't doing any of that. He's just scrolling through his Webpack configuration. Um, <laughs> But the way that I data science the web these days is often done using things like uh, BigQuery, and I write SQL statements. Um, it's not particularly exciting. You can turn it into a game and pretend that it's exciting querying tables and actually having anything output to the screen at all from a database. Wow, that was, that was exciting. Um, so I thought it would actually be interesting today, instead of just showing a bunch of SQL queries, for us to do something a little bit different. So, I'm a big fan of video games, and so I thought that it would be interesting for us to frame this problem space as an 80s 8-bit video game. Um, I think this is going to be an instant classic. Uh, I'm calling it Moto Remy, featuring our host, Remy. So the idea here is that we're going to get started. This is going to be like a motorcycle game. We're going to go select our, our user. There's Remy. We're going to get him onto a totally safe road. So let's start off. We're going to start off with measuring. Now, when your users go to your site to accomplish a task, they don't want to get stuck on that journey. They don't want any roadblocks in place. Because if they run into those, if they find that anything's really, really slow and they can't accomplish that task, they're just going to start running to your competitors. Look at Remy run. He's just, he's still, he's still going. He's running as far away from your experience as possible. Now, there are a number of good tools for us to science the web. Over the last couple of years, we've given you things like the Chrome Dev Tools, Web Page Test, Puppeteer, Lighthouse. Over on the synthetic side of things, we've given you tools like HTTP Archive, which is a really nice way to dig into how the web is constructed. And we've also given you things like more APIs for understanding RUM, so that you can actually query you know, what your users out in the wild can get. Now, as great as RUM is, I don't think that enough of us are taking advantage of it. And so over on the Chrome side, we've been thinking about what would queryable RUM for the web look like. And a few weeks ago at Chrome Dev Summit, we announced the Chrome User Experience Report. The idea here is that this is a public data set that captures key user experience metrics from real world conditions using real Chrome users. So we anonymize this data, it's rolled up to the origin. And the idea here is that all of this data is queryable. This is what a typical query um, might look like. You're usually in BigQuery. And the type of data that we expose here is, is interesting. We give you the origin. We give you form factors. So were these users accessing the site using you know, a phone or a tablet or you know, a laptop? We also expose um, metrics like first paint and first contentful paint. And we also give you the effective connection type. Now, this is interesting. Why is it interesting? So Chrome has had for a while this idea of the network information API, something that would give you a a rough guess at what connection type your user has. Unfortunately, this was a rough guess. And um, you could be in places where you know, you're actually connected up to Wi-Fi, but you're effectively getting a 2G connection, or something much, much slower than you'd actually expect to get. And so in Chrome 62, we introduced effective type, which uses a much, much better network estimation quality indicator based on round trip values and downlink values. So you're able to get a much more um, accurate picture of, of your user's effective connection type. Why well, this is interesting is that, for an example, like BuzzFeed. So for BuzzFeed, if you go and query it using the Chrome user experience report, we can actually tell you that most users accessing BuzzFeed on mobile are on a 4G connection. What validated this for us recently was that BuzzFeed actually added in um, RUM stats for their effective connection type, and these numbers perfectly aligned. So they were able to see that most of their users were, in fact, on 4G. But you, who may not, in fact, have instrumented this stuff using ROM, could discover this using the Chrome user experience support. So let's dive in to the next stage, which is optimization. Hopefully, by the time that you've you know, covered some of these ideas, you won't be trying to crash your competitors off the road, but you will have a few better ideas around how to optimize your mobile performance. So the first thing we're going to start off with is JavaScript. Now, Alex Russell says that network CPUs and disks are not our best friend. As we shift to more client-driven architectures, we end up sometimes paying for the things that we're sending down in ways that we can't always easily see. So let's take a look at something that isn't a SQL statement and look at the state of JavaScript on mobile. So this is what it currently is. This is across 500,000 top domains. 10% of sites are shipping down a megabyte of JavaScript. 50% of them are shipping down 300 kilobytes or more. Why does this matter? Why does this matter to you at all? Let's take a very quick look at the network stack. So a user on mobile tries to request a website. 
So it's going to go to the server. We're going to get back some HTML. We're going to then parse it. We're going to request some CSS, some JavaScript, and some images. And then all of that code needs to be parsed, compiled, and rendered. Now, this last step is very important. This is a very costly step. When it comes to JavaScript, it has a cost. If you want to be fast of the experiences that we're all building, the sites, the web apps, the PWAs, if we want them to be fast, we need to be fast at both fetching that JavaScript, so the network transmission cost, but we also need to be fast at parsing and compiling that code. And that's something that's a CPU-bound operation. In fact, here are the 2017 costs of parsing JavaScript across a wide range of popular devices. At the very top, we can see all the high-end devices. So you've got your iPhone 8s and your Pixel 2s, et cetera. The mid-range is where a lot of our users end up being. This is something like the Moto G4. This takes a lot longer to parse code on. This is for, by the way, this is a megabyte of JavaScript. And then, as we can see, as we go lower end and lower end and lower end, this phase takes a lot longer. We can zoom in on this problem. We can see that for a real site like CNN, using the iPhone 8's A11 Bionic chip, it's actually able to parse JavaScript in just a few seconds. Compare that to the Moto G4, which takes an additional nine seconds. That's nine seconds just being spent still parsing that code before we're able to get that experience booted up and interactive. Now, there are some patterns that can help you with delivering experiences that, that are heavily reliant on JavaScript in an efficient way. Purple, is, or PRPL, as some people prefer to call it, is one of those patterns. And the idea here is that you push the minimal code needed for the user to be able to get interactive. You render that code on screen. You lazy load the rest of the experience as they need it on demand. And then you take advantage of service workers so that you're able to avoid them having to go back out to the network to fetch those resources on repeat visits. This is something that's baked into modern CLIs, like Preact CLI, Polymer App Toolbox. And I wanted to, to show you with some data what impact this type of pattern can have. So this is a breakdown of V8's runtime call stats. So this is a granular look at where a JavaScript engine like V8 can spend its time. And what we see in our range is the time being spent parsing code. At, these are a number of progressive web apps, by the way. And lower down, we can see WeGo. This is one of the sites using the purple pattern. And it, they haven't actually done a whole lot of extra work. Just by making sure that their tooling is using purple, is using good loading patterns, they're able to spend a minimal amount of time parsing code so that they can actually get interactive more quickly. Now, another thing that's useful for us to consider is how much unused code we're shipping down to our users. Removing unused code can reduce your network transmission time, your CPU-intensive code parsing time, and your memory overhead. Over on the Chrome DevTools side, we recently added support for code coverage. This is the idea that you can actually see exactly how much of your code is being executed on page load and how much of it isn't being executed. This works for both JavaScript and for CSS. We also support doing this at runtime, so you can go and start interacting with different UI elements and see how that changes. Now, we thought it would be interesting to take a look at the top 50 sites. So we ran code coverage on these on page load. And we found that pretty consistently across the top 50 sites, sites were shipping down and using less than 40% of the code that they were making you load. We took a look at this 30 seconds in to the user experience. And still, these numbers didn't really change. It was still about 40%. What this means is that there are opportunities for us to be better breaking up this work so that our users aren't having to pay with their data plans to, to, for code that they're not actually going to use. Something that I've recently been spending a lot of time learning from is actually game developers. I think that the front-end community could learn a whole lot from game developers. They've solved many of the problems that we've, we were looking at right now in the past. One such idea is baking only what a section requires into bundles that can be loaded as needed. This is a quote from a PlayStation developer, someone that builds games. And on the front-end, we can actually take advantage of these ideas quite easily. The idea here is prioritize loading code that a user is going to use immediately, and then defer loading other code until idle time. You can take advantage of this using Webpack, so both Webpack 3, Webpack 2, Webpack 1. They all support this notion of instead of shipping down like a whole pieces worth of JavaScript to your users, just ship them down a slice and lazy load the additional pieces as needed. Now, code splitting is just one of a number of different techniques you can use to optimize JavaScript today. There are lots of things that you can do, everything from tree shaking to efficiently minifying your ES2015 code through to stripping out libraries that you're not actually using. Something I've been trying to encourage folks to do is use Babel preset n. Most people are currently compiling down to a range of browsers that 
actually support a pretty decent version of VS 2015. You don't need to ship all of those polyfills down. Now, taking a look at the practical side of this, um, Pinterest recently shipped a brand new progressive web app just a few weeks ago. This is something you can check out if you're logged into Pinterest. And they took advantage of a lot of these ideas. Their old mobile site was shipping down monolithic JavaScript. So they were shipping down just large, multiple megabytes of script down to their users. And that experience wasn't interactive until 23 seconds in. So you couldn't actually pin and have something happen until 23 seconds in. After adopting a lot of these patterns for efficiently loading their JavaScript up, the picture completely changed. They're able to get interactive in under six seconds. Their JavaScript bundle costs went down all the way to 150 kilobytes from 620. And they also took advantage of things like Webpack bundle analysis. So they're able to see, OK, well, there are cases where we're lazy loading in code, but we actually have a lot of duplicates across the different uh, chunks that we're loading in. And so they used Webpack's bundle analyzer to discover that if they shifted some of that duplicate code across those chunks all the way back into their main JavaScript bundles, they could actually overall save quite a lot of time. And that's just what they did. They saw a very small increase in their main chunk sizes by doing this, but overall a 60 to 90% decrease across chunks that were being lazily loaded in. Another thing that you could do is introduce workflows that force everybody on your team to think about loading times from the beginning. As we know, it can be really difficult sometimes to retroactively add in performance optimizations once an experience has already gone out the door. And this is, again, this is a quote from another PlayStation developer. Um, Tinder, they also recently shipped a progressive web app. They swiped right on the mobile web. And uh, they took advantage of performance budgets to help them get there. They actually defined per JavaScript bundle uh, performance budgets for their vendor bundles. This is what contains their Reacts, their Reduxes, their asynchronous bundles, so anything that's being lazily loaded in, their CSS. They also took advantage of route-based code splitting, so switching over from a model where you're effectively just statically importing in everything to one that uses React Loadable. Uh, thank you, James. Um, React Loadable uh, to lazily load in exactly what they needed when they needed it. And the impact that this had on the overall experience was dropping their load times for, for most users from about 12 seconds all the way under you know, five seconds. So this, this stuff does actually work. It's helping companies that are building real mobile sites out in the wild. Next up, we've got caching. So something that we haven't historically shared um, in the past is Chrome's cache hit rates. So here's where they are. So the way that caching works in a browser like Chrome is that in most cases, when a web page needs a resource, Chrome will start by looking it up in the memory cache. And if the memory cache doesn't have it, Chrome will then ask the network stack to handle the request. The network stack will eventually process it. And it'll start by looking for the resource in the HTTP cache. If it doesn't have it, it'll go back out and fetch it from the network. Now, as we can see, the uh, cache hit rate for something like CSS is actually pretty OK. For JavaScript, it's not in a great place. In many cases, we're actually getting about a 50% cache hit rate. Some folks might think that's good. I, I think that there's room to improve there. And the reason that this is so low is possibly for a number of reasons. Folks may not be setting their correct caching headers. Um, folks may also be invalidating their JavaScript pretty often. So one thing that you can do is just make sure that you have good cache control policies in place. There's lots of good documentation for this out on the web. But if you're trying to you know, reach a nice balance between client-side caching and quick updates, you can use sort of file name hashing, or fingerprinting, as some people call it, to change the URL of the resource and force the user to download a new response whenever content changes. Um, cache control policies let you do all sorts of neat things. Like if you wanted to make sure that you're revalidating resources every single time the, the user hits that page, cache control, no cache can help you do that. Um, my general like, caching checklist when I'm trying to do this stuff looks a little bit like this. So the idea is to try making sure that you're using consistent URLs when possible, take advantage of e-tags, identify resources that can be cached by intermediaries like your CDNs. Consider a service worker for more control um, if you need it on repeat visits. Uh, if we take a look at another progressive web app, something like Twitter Lite. So Twitter recently also shipped a progressive web app. And they rewrote their entire mobile experience into Twitter Lite, their new PWA. And one of the things that they were able to accomplish using a service worker is that on repeat visits, because they're statically caching their JavaScript, their CSS, the UI, the application shell, they were able to take their loading times on repeat visits from six seconds on a good 3G network all the way down to 1.5, so 75% improvement, which is kind of good. 
And if you're interested in learning about caching best practices, uh, do check out this blog post by Jake Archibald, Caching Best Practices and Max Age, Max Age Gotchas. It's, it's very, very comprehensive, and I found it useful, too. Next up, let's talk about priority. And this is another place where we can dig back into the HTTP archive. So most sites are not in a great place when it comes to how quickly they can be interacted with. 10% uh, of sites take 35 seconds before you can interact with them on mobile devices. 50% take 14 or more seconds before you can interact with them. And so in addition to just making sure that you're shipping down code that the user actually needs, we can also do other things, like making sure that we as a developer are informing the browser of what we think is the most important thing in the page. We want to kind of avoid places where Gary can be sad. So let's take a look at what resource, priori resource prioritization looks like in a browser like Chrome. So this is what our schema for prioritization looks like. Layout blocking resources like CSS or fonts get a very high priority in our network stack. Um, things like web fonts, images that are in a viewport get a high priority. And um, other resources like async scripts get a relatively low priority. The places where you as a developer can take a look at this are generally the network panel. So we've got a column you can enable there that does have these insights. Now, as good as a browser can be at trying to load content, we unfortunately are dealing, in many cases these days, with particularly large dependency trees. Folks are stripping down you know, a lot of code, lots of different resources from multiple domains. And you, as authors, know a lot more about how your page is constructed, and in particular, what is important, or what is the most important thing there. And so one of the ways that you can inform the browser what's important is using preload. Preload is a declarative instruction to the browser that basically says, well, I know that these, these resources that might be discovered later on in the process are actually kind of important. So please try to make sure that they're loaded as early on as possible. We can visualize this. So let's say that you know, a lot of us may at some point have written a single page application. So you're used to this idea, perhaps, of you know, a browser needing to fetch some HTML which then has to get parsed. We've got the JavaScript, which also has to be fetched, and then maybe some API responses, some JSON that then needs to be fetched in order to render anything on screen. Now, our JavaScript, because we're you know, declaring it perhaps at the end of the page, is going to be discovered relatively late on. But using LinkRel preload, defining this in our head, we can actually move the parse time for that request, move the actual fetch for that request much, much earlier on and actually make sure that the experience can get interactive more quickly because we're able to fetch that JavaScript early on in the process. Now, LinkRel preload um, has had an implementation in Chrome for a while. It's also been great to see this land in Safari 11, and it's currently a work in progress in Firefox. Over on the Chrome side, we've recently also fixed a, a number of bugs around using the fetch API with preload. So if you're using fetch, you're now going to get the same guarantees around LinkRel preload as you might have expected at one point. Now, using the HTTP archive, we can actually dig into how sites are using LinkRel preload. Doing this, I was able to discover that BBC News is using LinkRel preload to preload their style sheets, because they consider that to be one of the most critical resources on the page. And I hunted down, I kind of stalked one of their developers, and discovered that they were using this because they had a lot of blocking JavaScript in place that was kind of impacting their render times. So they decided to preload their style sheets, and this ended up having a positive impact on their overall start render time. You know, they were able to make sure that um, meaningful pixels on the screen were getting rendered early on. This also allowed me to discover that Twitter Lite was using LinkRel preload, talked to their developers, and discovered that by preloading their core Webpack bundles, their JavaScript bundles, they were able to improve how quickly they were able to get interactive by 36%. And this is not just an isolated case. This is a pattern I've been seeing with a number of new mobile sites. Tinder also used LinkRel preload for their Webpack bundles. And they were able to reduce first paint by 500 milliseconds and, and their load time by one second. It's not just for scripts. It's not just for style sheets. Financial Times, they're also using LinkRel preload. The most important thing for them, oddly, on this page is their masthead image, their brand logo. Um, and so they were able to use LinkRel preload on images to make sure that that masthead um, image was able to load a second faster than it previously was, just by making sure that that resource request was happening as early on as possible. Now, in addition to LinkRel preload, there are a number of other resource hints that you can use to tell the browser that things are important on your page. DNS prefetch will pre-resolve pre your DNS host names for assets. Preconnect will begin a connection handshake in the background. And prefetch is useful for letting the browser know that there are some things that will be useful later on in the user journey. So preload is useful for the current page. 
Prefetch is useful for future navigations, so anything that might be after the first route that they're going to hit. Now, in addition to being useful on link elements, all of this stuff can al also actually work um, as HTTP headers if, if you needed to do that. Uh, which takes us on to our next topic, which is what else can we do um, in addition to using link rel preload and resource hints to let the browser know that there are some things that are important? Well, HTTP2 server push is, is just one other example. So server push eliminates the idle time between your server sending down run response to the client and waiting for the next request. And the idea here is that instead of having to make multiple round trips in order to discover resources, you as the author of the page can tell the server, well, I know that you're going to need these specific JavaScript files or the specific style sheets. And so I'm going to push these down with the initial requests so that I can fill up the idle time that would be spent waiting for the browser to process those requests for other resources. This is something that you can set up you know, using Express. You can use Node um, to get this stuff set up. And it does have some advantages to it. Um, using push, you can actually sometimes improve your time to interactivity. But it's not without a few problems. H2 server push um, is not cache aware. And so there are many cases where you can accidentally end up pushing things into the user's cache that they may already have, wasting that, those precious bytes on their data plan. It can also end up delaying responses from an origin. And so although H2 push is a powerful capability, it's also one that you have to kind of hold correctly to get right. Now, um, Monica was talking about Polymer a little bit earlier. Uh, this is Polymer Shop. This is one of the, the first PWAs we built that used the purple pattern. And this takes advantage of H2 server push. So initially, when we were just shipping down resources for the Polymer Shop app, um, without using server push, we had this sort of idle time at the very start where we weren't really doing anything. We were just waiting for the page to be fetched so that you know, we could discover what resources were needed for the rest of the experience. And we were able to get interactive on this page in maybe seven or eight seconds. Taking advantage of H2 server push, we were able to push this time all the way out, you know, right to the left, and we were able to improve time to interactivity quite significantly by a few seconds. Now, there are a few workarounds that you can use with H2 server push to, to make sure that you're not over pushing. One of them is using cookies to track what's in the user's cache. Another thing you can do is use a service worker. So if you, with the purple pattern, if you're only using server push for the initial route, you just push down the resources a user needs, you register a service worker, and then for every subsequent um, request that might go out to the network, we're first of all going to check locally. If we have a resource already there, we're not going to go back out to the network. We're not going to incur those costs for over pushing things. And so it can lead to good things. It's also something you really need to be careful with. Now, when it comes to comparing H2 push versus preload, um, push can be useful for cutting out a, a whole round trip. Um, unfortunately, it's not cache aware. It doesn't have resource prioritization in place. Preload, however, works cross origin and cache. It's cache aware, it's cookie aware, has load and error events, has good content negotiation. It has fewer cross browser bugs. Um, if it was me, I would say that although the perfect preload might be a little bit slower than the perfect H2 server push, it's easier to debug and it's something that's also easier to reason about a lot of the time with, with fewer chances for you to trip yourself up. Uh, Jake Archibald, once again, um, wrote another great blog post about H2 server push where he documented where the rough bits are uh, and a few browser bugs that are worth keeping an eye on. Next up, let's talk about page weight. So digging into HP Archive, what we can see is that 10% of sites are currently shipping down about 5.5 megs worth of resources on mobile. 50% of sites are shipping down 1.4 megs. The vast majority of this is images. About 18% of it is JavaScript. A good proportion of the rest is images. We can also dig into how much of this resource that's being sent down ends up getting compressed. This is a particularly long SQL query. I won't bore you with it. But what we discovered was that 30% of the web is not sending down compressed content. So they're not taking advantage of gzipping or broadly or, or any of those other compression mechanisms that we have available to us today. So, Remember to compress your resources. Um, if you are just using gzip, you know, gzip, your pre-gzip, your static assets for dynamic content, you can use chunks transfers with gzip chunks. Um, apply content-specific optimizations first, though. So make sure that you're minifying things before you go and gzip them. There's still a little bit of wiggle room there for you to get benefits. <laughs> Setting this up is relatively trivial these days, for gzip at least, when it comes to Apache or Nginx. You can get this stuff set up in your HT access or your Nginx configuration. Lots of good documentation for it online. 
Now, although gzipping is something we consider to be kind of the basics when it comes to compression these days, um, Broadly has got a lot um, of improving browser support. It's actually pretty decent across modern browsers these days. And it effectively gives you um, much more uh, heavy compression compared to gzip for, for the most part. Um, Broadly at quality 11 can give you a really, really nice sweet spot. And what we've been finding lately is across a good portion of the industry, lots and lots of teams are experimenting with Broadly. Google Play was able to save 1.5 petabytes a day by switching over to Broadly compression. Uh, LinkedIn, especially for their JavaScript and CSS assets, they improved load times by 7% by adopting Broadly. Uh, Dropbox decreased the size of their static assets, their, their JavaScript, et cetera, by 20%. And Search Simple were also able to find good wins using Broadly for their largest JavaScript bundles. And it's perhaps, I've, I've mentioned JavaScript quite a lot in the context of Broadly. It's perhaps not surprising that when we use HTTP Archive once again to query, um, you know, where is Broadly used the most, it's actually used the most to compress front-end assets. So things like your JavaScript, your CSS, and your HTML. So when it comes to making sure that you're compressing things correctly and you're sending things down to your users that are as minimal as possible, the fastest and best optimized resource is the one that isn't being sent. So carefully validate everything that you're sending down to your users. Measure the performance impact of each asset. Question if it's important. And make sure that you're diligently compressing everything that you're sending down. Next up, we've got web fonts. So taking a look at the web font weight of most sites on mobile, we can see that 10% of sites are shipping over 200 kilobytes worth of web fonts. At the 90th percentile, sites are shipping down at least eight different web font files. Not sure why, but reasons. Um, and so it can be useful for you to have a web font loading strategy if you are heavily using web fonts. Uh, one other stat that we've got is that 68% of sites today, 68%, so there's a good chance that a number of people in this room are shipping down at least one custom web font for their pages. And so having a good loading strategy can be important. A lot of us are trying to avoid this, this idea of a flash of unstyled text being shown to our users. Gary was running into that earlier. Or a flash of invisible text being displayed to our users as well. These end up causing users a little bit of frustration because if you're loading a web page, you want to be able to get that content as quickly as possible. And maybe you care a little bit less about the aesthetics sometimes. Now, when I'm trying to construct my web font loading strategies, I care a lot about fallback fonts. So if for any reason the web font isn't going to load, I'd like to show something in place. And uh, Monica actually wrote this tool called the Font Style Matcher, which is really great if you happen to use Google Fonts. It allows you to match up Google Fonts that you're using with the closest fallback so that you as a developer don't really have to make that decision yourself, or at least you have a little bit of a suggestion in the right direction to head to. Um, I'm a big fan of this sort of diagram, this breakdown from a very comprehensive web font loading article um, on the Zach Leap blog. We're going to dive into some of the ideas here, but this gives you sort of a, a mental model for what decisions to make when you're trying to decide how to load your web fonts up. One of them is using the font display descriptor. So over in Chrome, um, in Chrome 60, we shipped support for font display. Uh, this is one of my favorite features when it comes to allowing you control over your font loading um, story. So font display for font face allows you to decide how your web fonts are going to render or fall back, depending on how long it takes them to download. I'm a very big fan of font display optional. This effectively gives you the, the behavior of, if a browser can't load a font really quickly, don't load it at all. What that allows the browser to do is, if it's able to complete the requests for those fonts, it'll include them in the HTTP cache. On repeat visits, when the user comes back to your page, if they happen to be in the cache, it'll then use them. But it doesn't impact the user experience quite as much as it could without this in place. We can also take a look at things like the impact of web fonts on preload. So without preload, if your experience heavily relies on web fonts, you can end up waiting quite some time for the font requests to start coming in. With preload, if, if these are important to your experience, again, you can push the request time for these resources much, much earlier on. Now, digging into HP Archive, we discovered that, in fact, uh, Link Rel Preload is most heaviest used for preloading web fonts. Um, this is Teen Vogue. They're using Preload for their, their custom Vogue display font. Uh, we're able to discover that Shopify, they're also using Preload for their web fonts. They were able to get a 50% improvement in uh, time to textful paint by, by taking advantage of this, which was good for their users. Um, and so consider preload for your web fonts if they're a heavy part of your experience. Have a web font loading strategy. There are so many things beyond what I've just talked about that, that are also possible. You can explore things like subsetting. You can explore things like using the CSS font loading APIs. There are lots of really great libraries written by the <coughs> likes of Typekit that you can take a look at as well. Then we move on to everyone's favorite topic, images. 
images that are still a very large part of the bloat that we send down on the web. So 10% of sites are shipping almost 4 megs worth of images down to their users. 50% of sites, probably a number of us in this room, including myself, are shipping down almost a meg worth of images. And the first thing I'm going to mention here is that image quality matters. A lot of us end up using tools that don't necessarily always give us the very best defaults when it comes to images. Um, speaking to a number of different image compression experts, they actually suggested that quality uh, 80 is actually pretty fine for the web for most cases. Um, most folks aren't necessarily auditing the different compression artifacts that are being generated by the different tools they're using to compress their images. So just be aware of that. Be aware that there are lower compression settings you can use that don't necessarily end up costing you when it comes to those artifacts. Um, be aware of modern JPEG encoders. Um, I actually wasn't until like last year familiar with Moz JPEG. Moz JPEG is kind of awesome. It's a, it's a modern optimizing encoder for JPEGs that balances um, different visual uh, visual sort of similarity to, to original sources. And it's something that's relatively easy to run. It's low cost when it comes to CPU time. There's also other experimental work being done by the likes of Google. Uh, Gwitzly is, a, is another um, JPEG encoder that we've been working on. Slightly slower when it comes to CPU time, but, but can also save you quite a number of bytes. And when it comes to at least Moz JPEG, um, using tools like Image Optim or XN Convert can give you access to these encoders in a relatively like, low cost. So Image, Image Optim is free. Um, a very low cost way. So if you're not already using image opt-in um, at the very least in your process, consider it. Uh, XN Convert is kind of a, a good cross-platform alternative if for any reason you can't use that. I personally have been shifting a little bit more to using cloud CDNs for my image processing. I use Cloudinary quite a lot these days. And that's taken a lot of the pain out of getting this stuff set up. So if you are trying to build a modern mobile site, these are some of the ideas that I try to keep in place whenever I'm building an experience. Make sure that you're choosing the right format, whether it's WebP or JPEG with a modern JPEG encoder. Size your images appro appropriately. Adapt them intelligently. Um, compress carefully. Make sure that you're, you're not you know, necessarily using too high a quality when you don't need to. Prioritize your critical images. Lots of folks I'm seeing these days using Intersection Observer and lazy loading to lazy load things below the fold. Um, and take care with the tools that you're using. Quite a few of them can still keep in the metadata from Photoshop and Sketch and other places. Now, practically looking at this from the, the viewpoint of um, production sites, uh, Twitter, when they were building their, their latest experience, um, they, they ran into this case where a lot of the Twitter timeline actually happens to use uh, a lot of images. And images can have higher decode costs on mobile than we might expect. In fact, comparing how long it takes to decode this image on a MacBook Pro to something like the, the Samsung Galaxy S6, we can see that there's a multiple second difference in, in how, sorry, multiple hundred millisecond difference in how long it takes to process this. Twitter Lite discovered that for the most part, they were originally shipping down high resolution images that just had way, way, way many, uh, too much of a dimension um, that the users weren't going to need. And so they were able to make sure through a, uh, a much better image compression pipeline, but also sizing their images correctly, um, a way to lower their image decode costs to improve overall rendering time. So they took decode costs from about 400 milliseconds all the way down to 19. They also did this really neat thing where uh, they introduced a data saver mode, where a user can opt in to saying, well, I don't want you to go and fetch high quality images because I care about my data plan. And this is something that the web platform helps you with by exposing whether data saver mode is enabled or not using the save data client header. Um, I spent nine weeks uh, this year sort of trying to document everything that I know about image compression in a free book that you can check out. It's available at images.guide. And I was, I was quite um, happy that a number of compression experts helped me um, fact check a lot of the, the advice that's given there. And then we're on to the last stage, which is monitoring experiences. We want our team to kind of get busted if they happen to be breaking our performance budgets. Because everyone on our teams is responsible for performance. It's never just one person. It's, it's never just one thing that we do during a single sprint. And so when it comes to Time to Interactive, if we're trying to compare what this looks like on an average piece of Android hardware where we're 3G, our Time to Interactive budget can end up being eaten. So if you remember the chart from earlier, multiple seconds being spent in your lookup, your TCP handshake, your HTTPS handshake. And so that leaves us with 3.4 seconds to ship down what's effectively 170 kilobytes worth of overall code. If we zoom in on this, we can see that there's quite a lot that we have to you know, try shipping down in, in, that, that, in that budget. We've got our application logic. We've got whatever framework, whatever ecosystem choices we've made, our routers or state management utilities, all of our critical path assets. And so if you're trying to build a modern mobile experience, 170 kilobytes is a rough, good baseline to keep in mind. Also useful to be aware that 
bytes are not equal. Um, just saying that you know I'm going to include one less JPEG is usually not enough because uh, it's not just about the network fetching cost of these things. Byte for byte, JavaScript is probably the most expensive resource a browser has to fetch. So just be aware of that. When you're evaluating web libraries, just be aware of their network transfer costs, their parsing compile costs, their runtime costs. Uh, there are a lot of good tools that teams can use to get a performance tracking um, set system in place. Uh, these are just some that my team use. So we, we love using Caliber, Speed Curve. Bundle size is great for your pull requests if you want to, to make sure that your team are held accountable for every addition they're making to the experience. Uh, Alex Russell has written a lot about this stuff over in Real World Web Performance Budgets. So check out his blog post, full of great data. So we've talked about three things today that kind of form this acronym MOM. So measure, optimize, and monitor. If you're building a modern experience, these are good things to keep in mind. And wrapping us up, performance is a journey. Um, it's a journey where a lot of small changes can lead to big gains. You will probably make a few mistakes along the way. Maybe you'll end up tripping some folks up. But ultimately, I hope that some of the stuff in this talk was useful to you and that you're able to build faster experiences for your users on mobile. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie. That, uh, that was uh, packed full of information.